history to underline the challenges and point mistakes and suggest a way forward to rebuild civilian institutions and improve governance. Uh, this evening, speaking to him, uh, we have Aditya Dhar, uh, <clears throat> who is an economist and his own research focuses on political economy and on agriculture. He is assistant professor of economics at the Indian School of Business and presently teaching at the Department of Economics, University of Maryland. Welcome uh, to both of you and to Maja House and our online platform. We do have a physical space, as you know, uh, but this is one of our online programs. Sanja Punjab is something that we've been doing for the last more than three years now. Uh, with discussions uh, ranging from different on different issues. We look at literature, culture, music, we look at our writers, we look at our common heritage on both sides of the border, uh, on both the Punjabs. So welcome once again, and over to you, Aditya, to take the conversation forward. Uh, great, uh, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Uh, and uh, PTG and thank you uh, Arvinder as well for the you know opening remarks uh, very kind of you to do that um, it's a great honor to be uh, in conversation with Dr. Sen um, you know I've uh, had a chance to read his work uh, his you know his book and then also a chance to get some of his earlier uh, papers and hopefully um, in this conversation we can talk about some of the themes that are very central to um, to Pakistan and its uh, institutional um, growth process. Um, so um, the way I wanted to uh, structure this conversation, maybe I'll just ask a couple of questions, Dr. Sen, feel free to you know, uh, dwell on them you know, and uh, reply as you deem fit. And uh, for the audience um, who are joining in, uh, please, please feel free to use the chat feature, uh, ask questions, and uh, as the conversation is proceeding, given a particular theme, if the question is relevant, I might just ask the question on your behalf. Uh, we have kept about 15 minutes of time towards the end for question and answers as well, uh, but we don't necessarily have to wait until the end. We can also ask the questions as we, as we go along. Um, so uh, once again, uh, thanks everyone for being here. And uh, Dr. Sen, you know, first of all, how are things in Pakistan, you know, given the flood situation, um, you know, how is your family and how, you know, how are you guys, uh, How's everyone doing there? Uh, just wanted to make sure that uh, I mean, I, I I know things are pretty uh, are very sort of you know severe. Just wanted to begin by asking. Everything was well. Right. First of all, let me thank Maja House for inviting me to participate in this conversation. We are going through a very difficult time. Uh, we are distressed that almost 33 million Pakistanis have been displaced from their homes, from their livelihood sources, along with the destruction of roads, bridges, culverts, which have disconnected them from the other parts of the country. So there is very much difficulty as far as the movement of goods and uh, people are concerned. And that is also creating problems for the urban areas which have not been affected so much by the floods which have been confined mainly in Sindh and Baluchistan because we derive most of our you know, agriculture produce vegetables, fruits and milk and everything from those uh, areas. But that has also been the supply chain has been disrupted. So it has affected an inflation has during the last few weeks has touched very high levels, which have never been witnessed in the history of Pakistan. The government had already been in very difficult economic situation, uh, but the losses now are estimated to be about $30 billion, which is almost eight to 9% of GDP. This is a very colossal damage and the country cannot afford. The UN Secretary General just visited us and he has promised that he will mobilize the international community. But so far the response has not been uh, as enthusiastic as 
I had seen during the 2005 earthquake, uh, where the international community just poured in both the supplies as well as the money in order to rescue and rehabilitate people. So we are hoping that uh, this appeal by the Secretary General uh, would elicit some positive response and our people who have been displaced would find uh, you know, the resources to get back to their villages and resume their livelihoods. Yeah, and so I would also encourage, you know, uh, folks who are joining in, given the gravity of the situation, that, you know, please uh, spread the message. And if you are in a position to also uh, donate uh, to these uh, uh, sort of, you know, these charities who are working, uh, you know, in Pakistan. Um, so, you know, with that, uh, Dr. Hussain, uh, let me, you know, kind of formally begin uh, with, um, you know, discussion about your book. Uh, but again, just before that, a small another prelude as I was um, you know, uh, going over your uh, CV, uh, I'd also noticed that you uh, actually were born in Agra. Uh, if I am, uh, you know, if, you know, if I have it correctly, maybe I maybe yeah, maybe I misunderstood. And I was just curious to know, even though that you were there for a, a very short period of time, do you have any sort of recollections, uh, you know, of India, uh, you know, growing up, like the first, uh, you know, four or five years of your life? Uh, I think we have audience on both sides of the border here, so I just wanted to make sure that they're able to connect with you as well. No, I don't have much memory of growing up, but I have the memory of uh, leaving Agra just uh, at a very short notice because uh, my parents told me that uh, our neighbors who were, you know, Hindus, but very, very friendly to us, they warned us that we should just leave the town immediately. And so with nothing on except our own clothes, we yeah. took the train and went to Surat, uh, waiting for a ship to take us to uh, Karachi. And we waited in Surat and people there, uh, despite the tension going on, uh, took care of our uh, needs, uh, daily needs of food and hygiene and everything. That's where I only remember that during the ship, because this was my first ship journey, I was very much seasick and I was vomiting. That's the only thing I remember. And then when I came to uh, Malir, which was a completely arid place and there were, you know, earth storms and I got into some kind of rashes and skins, uh, diseases. So that's not a very pleasant memory, uh, at least for yeah. my side. Yeah, I remember, yeah, the partition has extraordinary uh, stories of, uh, you know, uh, grit and survival um, and, and, and even heartbreak and I mean, the Agra sort of things reminds me of this 1973 movie called Garam Hava, which so I think also set in Agra, which talks about, you know, uh, this uh, story of this Muslim family and how they are have to have to move to Pakistan again. Um, great. Uh, so, you know, Dr. Sen, now sort of, you know, talking about your book, uh, you know, Governing the Ungovernable, I want to just uh, start off by asking what led you to uh, write this book? Uh, you know, you have previously written um, another book, uh, many books and monographs, um, but the one that, that, that I thought was at least thematically closer was Pakistan and its, and its elite. Um, so I wanted to just uh, ask you, how is this book different from your previous book? Um, and uh, then we can talk about like your major arguments in this one and, the, and slowly build the conversation ahead. But uh, some you know, uh, idea about the backdrop and the motivations behind writing this book would be helpful for this, uh, uh, for this audience, I think. I think that's a great question. Let me give you a little bit background. As a civil servant, I worked in what is now Bangladesh at the field level. So I have a great, and I learned the language. I speak Bengali. So I had great, uh, you know, interest in looking at how Bangladesh was progressing since 1971. And I'm a great proponent of normalizing India-Pakistan trade. And I've been working with Ikriar in New Delhi with Ishar Alawalia uh, for a long time. And I used to come to India several times a year 
in this particular uh, pursuit. And we actually got uh, with Anand Sharma and from the sea, we always got a breakthrough, but then there was change in the government. So because of that, I was a keen student of both Indian economy as well as Bangladesh economy. And my first paper, which I wrote comparative, you know, study of India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh was in 1991, it came out in 92, which showed that um, for the first 40 years, Pakistan was one of the top developing countries of the world, growing at six and six and a half percent per annum for 40 years. And the poverty had actually come down quite substantially while the per capita incomes of Pakistan was much higher than both India and Bangladesh to a significant scale. And the difference between the economy size, despite the population of uh, differential of eight times was only five times. So those were the facts. And I was very much following from there. And then I got a chance to go to Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington as a public policy fellow. And I decided that I would investigate as to why Pakistan from such a sterling position for 40, 40 years has now become a laggard in South Asia. And it is now actually not only um, behind uh, Bangladesh but, or India, but it is really drifting uh, towards a very low level uh, economic equilibrium. So that was the starting point. And you know, in um, Washington area there, as you know, Maryland, uh, there are very good resources, but particularly the Library of Congress. So I indulged myself into all the literature, both on Pakistan and other countries. And I decided to undertake this project. And I looked at the conventional explanatory factors, which explain the decline of Pakistan since 1990s to 2000. 15, because I wrote this in 2016-17. And I tested them empirically by looking at the data behind them. And I found that all the five major exploratory hypotheses, one, the foreign assistance flows, second, the garrison state syndrome, the third, the love of the US for the dictators, the fourth was a global economic uh, conditions being adverse. And fifth, that you have a situation where religious extremists and terrorists have destabilized the country. Uh, they don't stand up to scrutiny against the facts. And that is covered in my introductory chapter. So I started looking at the literature and I found that institutional economics, uh, under Douglas North has really done some very path breaking work in this respect. And then at the same time, you know, uh, Asimoglu and Robinson had come up with the why nations fail. And another friend of mine at uh, Harvard uh, also, you know, had looked at the institution's contribution towards economic uh, Road. So that led me to explore uh, this particular uh, dimension. And I started looking at the differential behavior and performance of the major institutions of legislature, executive branch, and the judiciary during these two periods. Uh, and I found that there was a decay of the institutions and there was a dysfunctionality of the institutions compared to where they were during the first 40 years. And I therefore tried to focus mainly on the executive branch because I wanted to convey the message that this interruption 
of the democratic path by bringing in the military rules is not the solution for the long-term economic and social sustenance of Pakistan. And that was the idea that why the military, which has become very much powerful, because they kept their institution absolutely not intact, but further strengthened it. They took the mediocres into the Army, Navy, and Air Force. And after 10 years, they transformed them into a first-rate human resource. While we took the best and the brightest into the government services, especially the civil services, and after 10 years, we transformed them into cynics and no-doers. And that, to me, was a startling uh, revolution that when you have a vacuum in institutional space, the stronger institution brings itself into to occupy that space. So how do we bring about a vacation of that space from the strong institution is to make our own civilian institutions strong. So that was the main motivation for writing this particular book. Great, that's an excellent summary uh, and a lot to unpack there. Um, but I'm actually very glad that you brought this point about how, you know, for the longest time, if you compare India and Pakistan's post-independence history, Pakistan actually does, just in economic terms, uh, you know, exceeds India's growth performance uh, by an order of magnitude. And that I don't know is a fact that is appreciated uh, by uh, by many people. Uh, so I think I'm glad that you you know uh, you mentioned that and this kind of downturn comes only later on in Pakistan's trajectory and the reasons that you have given uh, are definitely um, the top candidate explanations. But before I want but before we go into like dive deep into like the executive and the judiciary and the uh, and the various pillars that you identify and the need for reforms there, I do want to ask uh, because I think in the popular perception. Uh, you know, you mentioned these five factors, and I don't know if we have time to discuss all five. Um, you know, I, 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 want, I want to ask at least two of them, because I think in popular perception, people have this, you know, view that, oh, Pakistan is poor because of military dictatorship, and, and you're saying this Western support. That's the first hypothesis that you kind of rule out, but I want you to explain in some in slightly more detail, you know, for the uh, people who are joining here, why you think that is not true. And the second, I think, thing that people come up is like saying, oh, this rise of extremism, religion is an impediment. Uh, and so that is the reason why Pakistan is poor. So if you could just elaborate a little bit more about these two factors, um, given its, uh, you know, perception in popular press and, you know, at least in common, in, you know, in the common person's yeah. mind, that might help, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think, uh, both are very fair and relevant questions. Let me take the first one, the love of the U.S. for the military dictators. Yes. You know, Pakistan, right from the beginning, aligned itself in the Cold War with the United States, very categorically. You know, it became member of the CIADO and CENTO, both on the South Asia side as well as in CENTO. And these were military alliances. These were not just, uh, you know, economic alliances. So you did ally yourself. So there was an expectation that when chips are down, the US as a partner in Seattle and Cento would come to the rescue of Pakistan. But that didn't happen in 1965 when Pakistan was confronted with the war in India. Actually, they took away all the spare parts which were supplied by the US vendors of the military equipment, right? Then came 71, and despite the tilt of Nixon and Kissinger, nothing happened. The Seventh Fleet never moved into the Bay of Bengal. So people, and these were periods when Ayub Khan was in power and Yahya Khan was in power, both were military dictators. So those were two events during the military dictators. The third event was the Symington um, uh, uh, Amendment in the 1980s, when Pakistan was cut off from the US aid. And it was not until Afghanistan uh, intervention 
uh, that Soviet against the Soviets, that the US again resumed the support uh, to Pakistan. But before that, they were just not supporting Pakistan and there was no US assistance. And the fourth episode is that after Musharraf took over, we already had sanctions because of the nuclear testing of May 1998. They imposed additional sanctions on Pakistan because of the military coup, because they said this is a violation of the constitution. So I can re relate to you four major disjunctures between the interests of the US and interests of Pakistan. And therefore, to come to this conclusion that it is always a love for the dictators, it's not very true. My hypothesis, which I wanted to verify is that whenever there is a convergence of interests of the US administration and Pakistan, whether it is democracy or it is dictatorship, they come. And this is a fact of life. So after 2001, despite the fact there were military sanctions, the US came in with big help to Pakistan. After Musharraf quit in 2008, they still were in Afghanistan. So under the Cougar, uh, Cougar um, uh, bill, which was a large amount of 2.5 billion every year under the Zadari period, they dispersed that amount, which was twice as much as they gave it to the Musharraf government. So there is no empirical validity of this belief that this was always the interests of the US to support the dictator. That was not true. It is their interests which re reigned supreme. And whosoever was in power, they wanted to you know, align with them. So that I think was this particular hypothesis which I have challenged. And related to this is this very popular perception, both in India and Pakistan, that during the dictatorships, we got a lot of foreign aid. But you know, I've given the facts and there's a table in my book, which shows that as compared to the 1960s, the 1970s, when Bhutto was there, who was, you know, anti uh, US, we got more assistance, but not from the West, but from the OPEC countries who had become very rich. So there was a substitution of foreign aid from the West to the uh, you know, OPEC. So amounts were almost higher than what Ayub Khan had got. Then in the 1990s, again, if you look at the $11 billion of the foreign residents and non-residents deposits in the bank were frozen by the democratic government, which is much higher than all the US aid and the military aid, which Zawal Haq had received. And I showed you that in Zardari's period, Kerry Luger bill provided two and a half billion dollars every year for five years, as compared to 1.5 billion per year during Musharraf period. So this belief also that whenever, you know, you had dictators, they got foreign funding, that's wrong. That has not been proved by facts, because I looked at the original data uh, available in the Library of Congress, and I used that data in order to provide this uh, challenge to the conventional wisdom. Now, coming to the religious and extremists, the extremism and religious terrorism took shape after 2001, when we joined the US against the uh, rule of the Taliban. Right, that is where this whole thing started because there were people in Pakistan, Tariqe Taliban in Pakistan, who believed that we were in wrong. And they started all these acts of terrorism and tried to dismantle. But look at the 1990 to 2001. The economic growth rate had already come down from 6.5% to 4% during this period. So the economy had already started slowing down when there was no terrorism no religious extremism. 
And 2002 to 2008, Pakistan was the third fastest growing country after China and India with 6% growth rate. So the facts don't tally that it was a religion or extremism. And from 2014, when extremism was absolutely eliminated from Pakistan until recently when the new government in Afghanistan has come in and activities again started of terrorism in Pakistan territory, 2014 to 2022, our growth rate stumbled again to three to 4%. So look, there's no correlation between the intensity of the terrorist activity within the country and the GDP growth rate or the per capita income growth. So that is what I argued in this particular uh, volume of mine. Great. Um, thanks for uh, you know laying that out, and I think uh, the participants might uh, you know have think have benefited from that. Uh, I know Rashmi is asking a question about the garrison state hypothesis, but in the interest of time, let me move ahead, and maybe in the Q and A we can go back to say okay, why are the other explanations uh, you know a bit more unsatisfactory than the other ones? But now coming to your main thesis, you know about these the need for institutional reforms across a variety of different uh, you know pillars. Um, you know, uh, in the uh, in the country, uh, since you're talking about religion, I just want to take that one theme. You have an entire chapter devoted to the religious, you know, edifice and how you know that uh, you know is intertwined in you know almost the birth of the nation is you know is based on uh, you know is based on religion uh, as a key identity. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, you know what do you mean uh, and and and. Uh, by by this religious edifice idea and how does that uh, how are they intertwined in Pakistan's uh, development uh, journey uh, in what aspects does it promote it in what aspects does it impede it uh, or you know if you have anything else you want to add uh, that would also be useful. Thank you. Well, the religious leaders in Pakistan have a lot of influence, and there was a <coughs> newly formed uh, organization called Tariqat. Uh, Labbaq, Pakistan, which could bring crowds on the street and completely, you know, impede the movement of goods and services on the roads and the highways of Pakistan. So they can uh, always bring those people. But look at the elections results. Every single election in Pakistan, the religious parties have not done so well. They have not got even uh, more than 10 or 12 seats, whether it is the provincial governments, assemblies, or it is the national assemblies. So the people of Pakistan are not very much attracted to the propositions which are being you know, advocated by the religious leaders because they are negating the very spirit of Pakistani Islam. Pakistan Islam, like our basic precepts, is based on peace. It is non-violent. There is no division between different sects. Here they are trying to divide us into Shias and Sunnis, into the Sunnis, into the Barelvis, into the Obandis, into Ali Hadiths. That is not what Islam teaches us. It loves Islam loves for all brotherhood, for all mankind. It is a peaceful, uh, you know, religion. Therefore, they don't attract that kind of support when it comes to the ballot box because they will have the legislative power if they are elected to the assemblies and they can change the entire edifice of our constitution as well as our lawmaking. Therefore, people in Pakistan have not voted for any of the religious parties, but they have street power, no doubt about it. And you have, you know, madrasas, which are producing these, you know, kids who are actually the supporter of uh, these religious parties. And that is where the division takes place, that they cannot have the electoral advantage as compared to the street power they have. Great, um, thank you. Um, I, I now want to kind of pivot to this uh, other chapter in your book where you talk about you know restructuring the key institutions and I only 
talk about that because there are um, in, the, in the in the lack of interest of you know uh, in, you know in, in the interest of time, um, and I want to focus on uh, you know two or at least three important ones. Uh, one, I want to talk ask you about banking because I know that is uh, an area that is close to your heart. You spent you know much of your time. Um, uh, you know, uh, thinking about these issues uh, far more deeply than I think uh, many others uh, in this room have. So, uh, first of all, before I talk about uh, the you know the other factors, um, what do you think is the role of finance in the economy? I mean, we all agree that you know, it, you know it's very central. Um, and perhaps you know m uh, more pointedly, what lessons uh, going ahead? You know, would you uh, would you be uh, you know would you would, would you recommend uh, to uh, to uh, make sure that the access of credit that is uh, almost central to the development process is uh, is equally available to everyone? How does the banking structure have to be reformed? How does it have to be reformulated um, to be able to provide that kind of uh, you know um, uh, access uh, to uh, to people in Pakistan? I have to restrain myself because I can go on for hours on this particular topic. So you have. <laughs> actually touched the nerve. Uh, well, I'll be very, very brief because uh, when I um, took over as the governor of the State Bank of Pakistan, the nationalized commercial banks were 80% of the old financial sector. The interest rates, because of their losses, inefficiencies, NPLs were almost 20 to 21 percent. How can you do business in such an environment where the borrowing cost and the cost of capital is so exorbitant? So we undertook the reforms of the banking sector. And that included, along with the privatization of the nationalized commercial banks, which was a very politically explosive subject, the strengthening of the central bank as a regulator. You cannot have a private sector dominated banking regime without a strong regulator. Otherwise, the private sector will take you and the country for a right. So the crux of my whole effort was that if I'm going to do anything to bring efficiencies in the private sector banking, I must also protect the consumer interest and the interests of the people who do not have access to the financial system to get their due. So that I think was, and today, instead of having to bear the losses and subsidize that from the public exchequer, these banks are contributing billions, hundreds of billions of rupees as their corporate taxes to the government of Pakistan. The interest rates are down because of inflation, they have gone up high because the policy rates have gone up. But during my time, they had come down to 3%. NPLs were down from 25% to only 7, 8%. And the volume of credit to the private sector had also increased tremendously. SMEs and agriculture, which were very much, you know, disadvantaged, they got together about 22% of the total advances to the private sector. So there was a complete change in the ethos of these uh, banks. But unfortunately, because there is fiscal dominance in Pakistan, the government of Pakistan since 2010 has been running large fiscal deficits, which are financed by the banking system or the central bank, the access to the sectors like agriculture, like low cost housing, SMEs has actually declined. And that is something which I worry about. But that's not because of the fault of the banking system. It is because the preempting of the credit by a very dominant player, which is the government of Pakistan. So unless we put our fiscal house in order, the banking sector, unfortunately, would not have the kind of access uh, to these, what I call as underserved sectors of the economy or to the marginalized communities 
or to the rural areas or to the remote, remote communities. That is where the financial sector has to play an important role, which they are not playing right now. So I'll, I'll stop here because I, I don't want to get into more details. Yeah, and I also want to ask you some more questions about like, you know, as you were saying, the denationalization process and, you know, kind of get you more experiences. But again, I think uh, there are so many themes. So maybe in the interest of time, I'll skip to, you know, another topic, another question that I had. Uh, and since this is, you know, an audience which is also from Punjab, you know, agriculture is so central in the economy of Punjab, but also in the economy of, you know, Pakistan, although structural transformation has been taking place, uh, you know, in Pakistan as well. Um, the question that I wanted to ask you next was about, uh, you know, again, in this uh, section on institutional capacity, uh, institutional uh, reforms, you talk about the role of irrigation authorities. Um, uh, you know, can you ex elaborate a little bit more about, you know, what uh, uh, what you mean over there in the context yeah. of uh, groundwater depletion, uh, in the context of climate change, as we are already discussed, you know, right. causing these uh, havocs. So, you know, uh, over to you. Now, that's... Uh... A question that has been ignored in all the public policy discourses in Pakistan, I'm afraid. Um, we have a very elaborate, you know, Indus Basin uh, Delta, which really feeds and irrigates uh, almost 78% of our land. But it is being inefficiently used, both in terms of the losses from the source all the way to the end user, but also there is inequitable distribution of water. The influential and well-to-do people, you know, tempered with the modules at the water courses and even at the minor canals and divert and flood their fields with excess waters, which takes ultimately to the water logging. And while the tail enders, who are the poor segment of the population who need water in order to come up with decent yields per acre, they are denied that water. So this both inefficiency, where the water conveyance losses are quite high and inequitable distribution of this scarce resource is because of the mispricing. When I was, in the finance department in one of the provinces here, we used to recover 100% of the operation and maintenance costs from the farmers. Today, only 10% of those costs are collected from the farmers because all the landlords, the big landlords, are also members of the legislature of the, of the uh, provincial assemblies. And they don't allow any reform in this sector. The productivity of water is one of the lowest. It's compared to East Punjab. I have made this comparison and I showed that East Punjab is using its water more efficiently and more equitably as compared to us. Therefore, the yields per acre there are quite high. Here, the progressive farmers' yields are at least 60 to 70% higher than that of the national average. Now that, I think, if you move the national average closer to the progressive, we would have surplus production for exports and we will not have to import in years of shortages. So irrigation has to be an it's a uh, lifeline and the groundwater depletion was taking place. Now this uh, flooding people, the experts say, will recharge some of the groundwater, so the repletion rate will be stopped. But what cost? Look at the cost of this uh, recharging. So we have to have a policy for the use of groundwater, which is being used by two well owners who are very influential, again, politically. And the small farmer below the five acres or 12 and a half acres, he doesn't have either the equipment or the access to the groundwater. So that's the argument I make that the irrigation authorities have to be made autonomous so they're outside the control of the politicians. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much. Um, one last question from my side before you know I turn over to your uh, um, 
to the audience uh, who are, I think, asking some tough questions in the chat. Uh, but my last question to you would be, uh, you know, I want to wrap it up by, you know, the rule of law and like, you know, sort of justice and, you know, and judiciary. I mean, that seems to be like one, uh, you know, fair bone. I think people, you know, in developing countries understand that things are not functioning, people are poor, and there are, uh, you know, reasons for that. But I think uh, the expectations get mismatched when even they're unable to get, uh, you know, recourse for their grievances. Uh, and uh, uh, and so can you talk a little bit more about, you know, how do you think the administration of justice uh, should happen? Uh, what are the current bottlenecks? And uh, what are some of the key, uh, you know, reforms that you propose in your book that can right. help uh, uh, ensure the rule of uh, law and order uh, in the country? You're absolutely right. Rule of law is the most critical ingredient for dem democratic governance. And why I say that we are ungovernable, it is because an ordinary citizen of Pakistan does not have access to the entire chain of the administration of justice. You go to the police, they would not register your FIR until and unless you bribe them or you are accompanied by an influential person from that area. Otherwise, Sounds very they familiar to something the, happening in India as well. <laughs> but they sorry, will not do anything. Okay, so first they have registered. During the investigation, they will try to temper with the evidence in order to make the case weak so that the other party who has actually won them over can have their day. Even if the investigation is right, then the prosecution is so weak and the prosecutor can be purchased by the influential parties that when it is presented to the court, the court says, well, there is no evidence. The witnesses are not corroborating what you are alleging. So the case is dismissed. And it takes years altogether. And how can an poor person with modest means afford these very, very high exorbitant, you know, costs of going through all this process. And that to me is the reason why the land title disputes occupy about 80% of the court management registers. 80% of the cases are related to land disputes because of the revenue authorities in collusion with the police and in collusion with the other parts of the administration of justice, you know, chain have been able to influence the tempering of the records. And that dispute uh, goes on. Well, this is enforcement of contract. How can you have enforcement of contract? How can you have collateral for your loans if you want to expand your agriculture? How can you have collateral because there is a land title which is dispute and it is a litigation. My proposal was that we should have a alternate dispute resolution mechanism for small disputes and we should completely computerize and digitize our land records. Therefore, they are available in a transparent manner on the website. And anybody has any questions or any challenge, they can go and get it done at the starting point of the land record authority rather than go to litigation. And then have your alternate dispute resolution. So the more you reduce the workload of the course, the quicker will be the disposal of the legitimate cases and enforcement of the contracts the property rights preservation, which are the basic of the entire, you know, private sector run economy would be strengthened. Otherwise, it is a law of jungle. Whosoever is, you know, influential, whosoever is powerful would do things according to their own discretion and volition. And to me, this is why Pakistan is ungovernable because we don't have a rule of law where a poor person with modest means can get access to justice. 
I'm glad you could bring the title back in because you know the title is a bit, you know a bit provocative and can I think when on first glance people might I think misunderstand the title and what it means and who are ungovernable. It's not I mean it's not the people are ungovernable. It's like you know uh, as you're saying the um, the factors are you know are critical have led to this ungovernability. So I'm glad that you were able to clarify that. Um, so I think we are we have some uh, you know a lot, of, uh, a lot of questions in the chat. Uh, I have a couple of other thoughts, but. Uh, Maybe I will uh, hand it over to, um, you know, uh, good time to have a Q&A right now. So should I, um, are we unmuting the people uh, for the q and I, I kind of forgot that, Preeti, or, uh, are we just, um, am I just reading out, uh, you know, questions that I think are uh, critical? Yeah. Yeah, please just go ahead and take the one which have come in chat. Yeah. Okay. Um, so maybe I think I can start off with one uh, at the beginning, which was, um, I guess Rashmi's question was about the Garrison state hypothesis. This is, uh, she's asking the three wars with India, uh, allegedly foreign funded, particularly US, then alleged funding of military in Punjab and Kashmir. How do these factors in the downfall of the economy of Pakistan? So I guess, you know, how does, I guess this is a question, like how do you refute the Garrison state hypothesis as, as I understand I, it? I prove in my uh, introductory chapter and later on that when the economy was doing well in the first 40 years, the defense GDP ratio on expenditure was almost 6%. That was very, very high. And as a part of the budget, it used to take about 35, 40%. During the slump period, it has come down between 2 and 3%, 2.5 to 3%. And therefore, the proportion of federal budget or consolidated budget of the federal and the provincial governments, it is less than 20%. So this idea that all the money is sucked away by defense, all our money is being sucked away by debt servicing. Defense took 1,500 billion last year. De debt servicing is going to take away 4,000 billion. And that is federal government's net revenues because under the finance award, 60% of our divisible tax pool has been given to the states, to the provinces. So the federation or the federal government is so poor that they cannot afford to carry out the debt servicing, the defense, the development, and running of the civil administration and subsidies. That is where our problem is. It's not that defense is going to take away all the money. Quick clarification question, people. I don't know if they understand what debt servicing is. Maybe if can you can you explain that in a in a, in a, in a, in a well, layman's a, like what do you mean by the payment debt, of, debt service? It's the payment of the principal amount and the interest on the amounts you have borrowed in the past. And our debt uh, ratio today is close to 100% of GDP. So when you have such a heavy burden of the debt, and it is only the federal government which is going on uh, servicing this debt, it is really creating a fiscal imbalance, which I pointed out to you earlier, that that's why they carry out the uh, uh, banking sector uh, is not uh, paying to the private sector. Thank you. Um, there's a next question after Rashmi was from Sarbo, uh, Sarbojot. Um, and I guess this is a question that is trying to understand. I think it's phrased differently, but I think they're trying to get at you know the lack of diversity in Pakistan, maybe. But but here's a question. As biodiversity is critical to equilibrium in the order of world, do you think social cultural diversity is an imperative to socioeconomic ecosystem in a country? Um, I think it's trying to get at, you know, is a lack of quote unquote like diversity in a social sense uh, in Pakistan, is that leading to um, the problems? But I, I let you answer there is, that. There is a uh, fragmentation in the society, which is based on ethnic and linguistic and regional grounds. But there is no particular you know, marker you can hang on and say, this is where the lack of diversity it is. We're losing your voice, Dr. Hussain. Can you? 
I'm saying it is the yeah. elite capture, which is the most, you know, dominant part of the governance in this country. Yes, people from the poor segments, from the rural areas, from the backward states, they have also occupied high positions in the decision-making process. They have done very well, but their behavior is the same as the other elites. So I characterize that it is not whether you are a woman or you are a Christian or you are a rural uh, migrant or whatever it is. When they reach a certain level, there is identity of interest, and that is the interest of the elite class. And that is my other book, the Pakistan, the economy of an elitist state. That is a convergence point. So you may have a diversity to begin with, but it commingles after a while, homogenizes this, and that diversity disappears because there is the identity of interest of the elite class. Okay, There's some technical questions on the fall of the rupee, which I think we can skip. Um, I guess maybe I'll ask you uh, Guru Desh's uh, question. Um, he was kind of saying, which I think it's maybe misplaced, but I'll let you respond anyways. It says, your talk so far shows that there is not much disappointment, um, but I think you were, you know, I, th I, th I think you did a good job explaining this one. But anyways, he says, your talk does not show much disappointment. Why do you call your country ungovernable? Oh, <laughs> I thought I have not been able to explain to her what I've been saying for the last 45 yeah. minutes. I, yeah. There is a lack of communication on my part that I was not able. I'm disappointed that a fast moving country, which was among the top 10 developing countries has now become the sick man of South, East, South Asia, despite all what we have done to make this country, you know, a great nation. And that is because our institutions of governance have completely failed yes. us. And that is the reason why I am so disappointed. Right. Um, maybe a very narrow question from Gurdas Dadwal. Will the proposed division of West Punjab solve the water sharing issues or worse than them? Uh, I'm not sure the full context, but since it was in the chat, I thought I might just ask it. Well, I think the Indus Basin Works uh, had replaced some of the losses of Satlaj and Bias. But from my point of view, for the future, the water management is now entering a completely new phase with the melting of the glaciers. I was in Gilgit, Baltistan recently, and I saw myself how much the glacier melting is hurting both the area as well as the rest of the country. So India and Pakistan have a responsibility to look at the origin of these rivers and come up with a new you know, contract between the two countries, which will sustain the livelihood for both these countries. And they have to revisit in the light of the climate change challenges, which are going to intensify during the next few decades. So it is a long-term strategy well, we have to start there. And that's an area of regional cooperation where the bilateral interests of both the countries coincide. And I think this is what I would very much like to suggest to the Indian policymakers and the Pakistani policymakers that they have to revisit the apportionment of uh, the water resources. Okay. So more, more sort of geopolitical challenges uh, there. Uh, one question from Ramanjit, uh, and I guess this actually does talk to your point about local governance in the book, so it's a good question. Um, he says, uh, I think you mentioned a 60-40 ratio of division of taxes between states and center in Pakistan. That is really high. What are the implications for decentralized governance? Um, maybe you can also talk a little bit well, about Well, I'm a great believer that, that the devolution and financial decentralization should not stop at the state or the province level. It should go down to the local government level. 
And we have experimented this between 2001 to 2008. We had a very strong local government system where we devolved almost 13 or 14 provincial departments to the districts level and to the tehsil level. And the response and the level of satisfaction of the people in the delivery of services was very, very positive. So yes, they have got the resources now, but I don't want those resources to sit in Karachi, Peshawar, Lahore, or Quetta. They should go down to the district level where the actual interaction between the government functionary and a citizen takes place. You go for education, you go for health, water supply, sanitation, public transport. These are all local problems. These are not provincial problems. So these must be given to the district governments along with the resources. So that's my contention. I've been writing about it. Even in this book I've written and I keep on emphasizing this particular point. Uh, well, Aditya, there's a question from Amara, and I have requested him to unmute, and uh, he's already please, unmuted. Go ahead. And uh, please, Amara, you can be a little brief for your question. As you mentioned, your question is a little lengthy. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, good evening to all my respectables. Sir, I'm Amara Imran from Gourmet College and University, Faisalabad, doing my BS in Pakistan studies. So today, my question is especially regarding my homeland, Pakistan's governance during its first nine years of its existence, till Pakistan got its first constitution in 1956 and about the UK rule in Pakistan. Sir, if we talk about the performance of governance of Pakistan during the 1947 to 1956, then we can see that it had not been better due to mature disturbance among the Pakistani politicians. And on the other side, Pakistan remained under the rule of the UK crown as King George II and his daughter, Queen Elizabeth. Sir, what do you thing to say about the governing the government of Pakistan procedure in Pakistan at that time? Was UK rule beneficial for Pakistan at that time by for bilateral ties or not? I couldn't understand. Uh, could you please, Aditya, could you please repeat the question? I think, I think the question is, do you know, before Pakistan enacted its constitution, it you know took a while, right? So India did it immediately in 1940, uh, right. you know, by 1950. Pakistan, yes. I think in 1956. So yeah. the question really is that in this intervening period between 40, uh, 47 to 56, uh, where you know there was no constitution and you were under and Pakistan was governed by UK rule, I, you know I guess uh, I guess it was part of, it was part of the crown maybe. What yes, were the economic uh, outcomes in that period? Were they better or worse than when the country became uh, you okay. know truly like a republic? Yeah. This was a period when Pakistan inherited absolute no economic or social infrastructure. It was the backward area of India, and it was only producing agriculture, produced no industry, and that's it. It had to rehabilitate 8 million refugees, which is almost one fourth of the population. It had to start setting up its own government machinery. They didn't have the money to pay the salaries of the civil servants. And the, self, the civil servants who migrated were only a handful. So it was a big challenge for them. So nobody was actually expecting them to do anything miraculous as far as economic development was concerned. But the first five-year plan actually laid down the foundations for plan development in Pakistan. But as you know, the plan takes long time to be implemented. In 1958, the Ayub government took over as a martial law and the economy really took off because they produced the institutions like PIDC, which industrialized Pakistan, Agriculture Development Corporation, which brought about green revolution like India. It set up WAPDA, which carried out the Indus Basin Works, and the Planning Commission, which was one of the most famous all over the world as a planning institution. So those institutions are the backbone 
of the 1958 onwards to 1990. Despite Mr. Bhutto's nationalization, Pakistan's economic growth on the long term did not really suffer very much. Great. Um, thank you. So um, I think that's all the questions that we have. Um, so, you know, Dr. Hussain, um, you know, thank you. We were also on, I think, on about time. We had one hour. Um, so um, thank you once again. It was a pleasure talking to you, listen to your talks, uh, listening to your thoughts. Um, and, we can uh, uh, ask uh, Dr. Guru Tesh to come in now, please. Oh, yeah, please go to ahead. To do yeah, a yeah. formal <laughs> thank yous. Yeah. Thank oh, you I very, see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for. Uh, uh, before I, I think um, I thank these two illustrious speakers, I guess uh, I need to thank uh, the Maja House, uh, P.T. Gell and Arvinder Chamak for organizing this talk. Uh, they have been able to bring in this, these two uh, brilliant speakers and um, analysts at the same time. Uh, and I guess um, the talk has been so informative as well as um, say eye-opening uh, to the to the audience on both sides, I could relate many of the things that um, Pakistan faced uh, during those years. Uh, they were as much uh, you know, close to Indian um, phases of development. We we also went through some of those uh, things, and I'm particularly happy that uh, you did mention some of the things that we normally uh, talk about uh, Pakistan. Uh, I belong to Amritsar where I have been watching Pakistan television for a long time, though of course these days it's not available. But uh, in those days, I could see that Pakistan was really developing the first 40 years. And I think it was rightly pointed out that somehow the graph went down for whatever reasons, I think uh, Dr. Ashraf Hussain has been able to tell us. But uh, I would say that uh, these uh, graphs keep undulating um, in every country's <laughs> economy. Uh, but the issue is that how US was um, interacting with Pakistan and how today, for example, the, the militants or the religious groups are uh, interacting with the government. I mean, we have been able to get some really good insights into that. Thank you very much for all this. And I think uh, I admire uh, Adit Siddhar for um, getting the best out of Dr. Ishrat Pustan. Uh, he is no doubt a highly scholarly and a very um, well knowledgeable person about this. And I'm glad that Aditya uh, has been able to get the best out of him. Uh, thank you, both of you. And on behalf of uh, Maja House, I think, and the audience, uh, we have the pleasure of um, having you. And I think we will probably be, like to have you sometimes more uh, because um, I think these kinds of interactions uh, make us both wiser on what we are doing and what we should be doing uh, in, in order to kind of make our countries better. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to add a couple of things. Uh, first of all, of course, thank you, Aditya, uh, for drawing out Ishrat Saab and teasing out a lot of the arguments that are in the book. Um, most of us, of course, have not read it. So it's a very good idea to uh, at least get an understanding of what it, um, uh, you know, and it's a big book. I know that. Uh, so I just wanted to say also about uh, the programs that are coming up on Maja House online. Uh, next week, that is on Saturday, the 24th um, of September at 6 p.m., we have a discussion on a book uh, by best-selling author Arjun Gen. Uh, uh, this is on his book called The Anatomy of Loss, which is an Amritsar novel uh about a young boy growing up in amritsar in and around amritsar and you know blue star and then uh, all of the 1984 and what that means to the six and then on the 25th of september we have a physical session at maja house uh, that begins at five o'clock in the evening uh, and everybody who's in amritsar please do attend uh, the book is called dakhal and uh, by nikita Azad and the author will be present uh, for a discussion there and I think we will also have uh, her books for sale. Uh, the book is in Punjabi, it's a collection of feminist essays and I think it will be quite exciting so do come for that as well. Thank you very much once again 
uh, Ishad Saab and Aditya for being here for this discussion and for this entire, you know, for the audience for being here with us and asking such perceptive, wonderful questions also. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank